Uh, well, these days I'm best known for the critique of, of foreign aid to the poor areas of the world, like Africa, out of out of poverty. Um, and that critique is, you know, comes from um, kind of bitter experience. I spent 16 years at the World Bank working to fight world poverty as a, very much an idealist, wanting to help the world's poor, and really seeing a lot of those efforts fail. A lot of the official foreign aid efforts fail to help the world's poor. I saw you know, $2.3 trillion spent on foreign aid over the last 50 years. And I saw the results of that in World Bank trips that I went on that were just nightmares of bureaucracy and ineffective uh, you know, experts flying in and thinking that they were experts in the problems of Africans after spending a, a week in a, in a luxury hotel room in Africa. You know, that, and you know, frankly, uh, there was a moment of disillusionment and then there was a desire to change things, you know, a desire to change the foreign aid system so that it would work better, so that more of that $2.3 trillion that's been spent over the last 50 years would reach poor people and not be you know, dissipated in luxury missions from World Bank headquarters or in ineffective government bureaucracies on the other end. The critical thing that makes, makes foreign aid fail so often, is, and this is really heartbreaking, is simply that the, the poor who are the intended customers of foreign aid, just like you know, the, you are the intended customer of uh, the Pepsi Corporation when they sell you Pepsis, uh, but un unlike your relationship with Pepsi, uh, y the poor have no right to complain and no right to turn down the product if they don't like it. Uh, the poor just get foreign aid foisted on them by these ill-informed experts, and there's no feedback from the poor, whether they're satisfied or not, whether the money even reached them or not. There's no accountability on the part of these official aid agencies for whether they got the money to the poor, whether they made the poor better off by getting them a drink of clean water when they previously didn't have access to clean water, or by getting them an essential immunization to prevent their child getting measles, or to get them a bed net to prevent them from being bit by a malarial mosquito. There's no accountability for these basic things. And so these basic things don't happen. You know, where there are no incentives and no accountability, then that's another insight of economics. Then it doesn't happen. And that's indeed what it has happened in foreign aid, tragically. It has not happened. You know, uh, the money gets sort of leaks, leaks out all along the chain that starts in Washington and New York with United Nations or the World Bank or other official aid agencies. And it gets sort of lost all along the way um, because there's there's, on the part of the rich country public, they're mainly concerned with how much aid money is spent, and then they're satisfied. Well, you know, we spent $2.3 trillion to help the world's poor, uh, so our job is done. And they pretty much stop paying attention after the money is spent. So with, you know, a long chain of officials in charge of the money, uh, with no one looking over their shoulder to see how they're spending it, there's plenty of ways that it leaks. It leaks into expensive salaries, for the people working in headquarters, like me, I, I have to admit I was one of those who benefited from this gravy train. Uh, there's you know, all the administrative costs in which huge amounts of money are wasted of the official aid agencies. The World Bank has a budget of $1 billion to help the world's poor, even though it only disperses about $7 billion in, in aid to help the world's poor. It has an administrative budget of $1 billion. Uh, then the money is given to the government in the poor country, and then the, the money there either gets dissipated in ineffective bureaucracy, where it's just paying the, ser the salaries of unmotivated civil servants who have no incentive to help the poor, or it's outright stolen through corrupt officials. You know, there's uh, an estimate that something like uh, 40 to 60 percent of drugs uh, meant for health clinics in West Africa get stolen before they ever reach the clinics and get sold on the free market, on the black market. Uh, so that's where the money disappears. And then, you know, at the end of the day, unfortunately, nobody seems to care. That's the, the tragedy that breaks my heart over and over again, that no one cares that this money is not actually reaching the, the, 
the most desperate people in the world for whom it is attended, people who live on less than a dollar a day. You know, it's just an unbelievable measure of deprivation, people living on less than a dollar a day. And that's who the money was intended for, but it never reached them. Well, people just assume that, uh, you know, if the money is budgeted for helping the poor, that it goes to help the poor. Uh, you know, unfortunately, there's not a very strong incentive to, uh, if you're just you know, the average taxpayer in the, in the U.S. or in Europe, there's not much incentive to investigate, you know, whether some poor village off in Ghana, West Africa, uh, received the money or not. Uh, you can't, you know, mount your own investigation and find out. Uh, the press, unfortunately, doesn't seem to have enough motivation to really dig deep into whether the money reaches the poor because they mainly providing stories for U.S. consumption that are mainly mostly about you know disasters, striking Africa, wars and earthquakes and famines and droughts, and not about the more kind of pedestrian matter of you know did uh, a, a dollar of aid money get to a baby in time to give them a, a rehydration treatment so they wouldn't die from dehydration due to uh, a disease that uh, kills two million babies a year due to dehydration. Mm -hmm.